Today on Marketing Mavericks, we talked to Ted Narden, who's the CEO and founder of Ideal Dialogue, about the science of customer service. Is there really a prime directive? And does Comcast really care? Well, we're going to find out how to avoid their missteps and more. Coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Marketing Mavericks is brought to you by Lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,700 high quality online courses, all for one low monthly price. Try it free for seven days. Visit Lynda.com slash MM. That's L Y N D A dot com slash MM. And by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to 50 plus job boards with one click. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four day trial now at ziprecruiter.com slash mm. That's ziprecruiter.com slash mm. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks, where we talk about everything at the intersection of marketing and technology. And today, our, our, our conversation is really about the customer service and marketing relationship. How are we handling the evolution of customer care? And are we selling and saving customers in the process? With marketing changing and the ad advent of social media and the engagement of brands using the web, um, how are we interacting and building relationships with customers? Well, our first guest today is a company that focuses on the science of customer care, as well as the technology of helping better understand customers and treat them with the most relationship status that we can. Welcome, Ted Narden. Ted Narden is the president of Ideal Dialogue Company and our guest today talking on Marketing Mavericks. Thanks, Ted, for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So I, I, I give a little, gave a little setup to Ideal Dialogue, but what is Ideal Dialogue? Well, we're a company that's uh, dedicated to improving customer experience, um, specifically at the point at which two people come in contact. So that includes voice, that includes uh, chat, includes email, and especially the, uh, the social realm. We really have looked at it um, very deeply and said, you know what, um, there's a lot of different aspects that you can look at from a customer experience perspective, but the one that we chose to focus on is the one we think that gets neglected the most, and that's human contact. And what, so your background, I'm taking it is, and I've, I've looked you up on LinkedIn, I know a little bit about your background, it's call centers and working in the call center atmosphere, and I've had many years in that space myself. I've actually worked for Comcast, which has been a lot in the news lately, as well as Verizon and GTE and a variety of other companies that have major call centers. And the, there's been a standard of the way that customer service employees have been hired and trained. And But the evolution of the way that we treat customers has trans, transcended um, a lot of that original training. And I'd say especially 10 years ago versus today, that's very different. Why did you decide to start Ideal Dialogue? Oh, that's a great question. You know, we, we've spent a long time in this industry working through, I guess, our issues, so to speak, starting out many years ago with um, spending all the time on the phone we needed to, uh, with customers and working through how to hire the best people and, and being very selective and have gone through uh, periods of growth. Um, the industry has grown leaps and bounds. We have call centers that have popped up all over the place. Uh, in fact, at one time, I remember when I was a kid, people said that by, I think it was the year 1990 or some date, I couldn't even fathom, uh, at least one in three people could say they've worked for a fast food restaurant. And I think that uh, the last stats I've seen, about one in three people will be able to say the same thing about working right now in uh, some sort of call center. Uh, it's, it just has really taken over who we are. Um, so in that process, I've been in 22 years, um, started in the help desk arena where we were working on very refined and uh, higher level, if you will, technical problems. 
and just fell into working in the um, the customer support arena in general. And then over the last five or 10 years, uh, realized that there has to be a better way to do things. And I was very lucky to be brought into uh, this company in order to, to build that um, sense of what do we do different? How do we really, I guess the question was, how do we crack the code for giving better customer service? Even though it sounds so easy and it sounds like something that you just wake up in the morning and ought to be able to do, it actually turns out it's far more complicated than that. And so that's really what the company was born out of was how do we improve customer experience and, and in general customer care? You know, I used to do a lot of training on sales and how to listen to the customer needs-based selling. And a lot of what Comcast is being criticized for is is stuff that I used to train on um, because there's expectations. But today, it's so important to really build a relationship. So my question is, is it really possible in a really quick, maybe five-minute conversation to build an emotional connection and a relationship with the customer? I mean, is it possible? It is absolutely possible. Is it is it always possible? No, it's not something you do out of the gate with everybody because not everybody wants it. I mean, we're social beings, and it's not a lot different on a on a phone call or let's say even a chat session. And we have different moods and different things going on. But what we what it is possible to do is to approach things in a little bit more human manner and to determine what the person wants to do. And if they really want to have some sort of uh, emotional connection, then going with it has an, an impact beyond what we could ever imagine. In fact, that's really a lot of what we're about as a company is helping people to build those environments and to build uh, overall approaches in their customer support that allows the, uh, the agents and everyone actually involved to enjoy their job more by having some of that human contact. So yeah, it is possible, but it's it's also difficult. Remember that there are a lot of things going on now with customers that weren't going on 10, especially 15 years ago. Uh, the technology has become far more complicated and it's, and it's not just the technology of perhaps the product we bought, but the technology of getting help for those uh, products are involved now. And um, so people actually come into these situations with, with agents um, with a, a lot greater problem, bigger problems. They've solved them themselves. And that's kind of the second thing. It, they have a lot of avenues now in which to solve problems themselves. So when they actually come to an agent and want help one-to-one -one with somebody, they really are looking for something more than what they got outside of that. And that, that's difficult to, um, to step up to as an agent. A third factor that comes into this is that um, people now have a lot of different outlets to go to. Um, we have social media, we have chat, we have all of these different areas of, to get help. When I call and I want to talk to a human, I want to talk to a human. I don't want to talk to somebody who's giving me a transactional approach, somebody who doesn't have uh, the humanistic qualities. And so I'm a lot more demanding now, at least uh, as a customer. And then really the fourth one that you and I've talked about before, and I thought you brought up as a great point, one of the big things happening lately is that people are taking their experiences from those conversations and they're going viral. They're taking them to the social space and they're going around with them. And it's interesting to me that most of the call outs for where these have been big um, incidents over the last several weeks have all been the result of two people interacting. They aren't the result. And then there are things happening out in the social media area where things that are posted go viral. But when you look at those things really hitting the news lately, they are the result of things gone wrong between two people having a conversation. You know, I, and I want to I want to talk about the the attention span that we ask our customers to have today because they are on a lot of different you know their second screens and third screens. They might be calling into the call center, but they're also you know tweeting about it and they're on Facebook sharing with their friends that they're having a, this problem that they're having. And so there's a lot of distraction and they're looking for answers in a lot of different places. And I, I want to drill down on that. Before I do, I think I, it's better to kind of set the the ground for ideologic in that. One of the things that I was most interested about your company, and I think more and more even brands are trying to understand customers better. We're not just creating a sales training. We're not just creating customer service training that answers the needs to our business and maybe provides a product or service that we're offering a customer, but we're really trying to get behind the science of it. And you guys actually have, which I'm going to give a little geeky reference here, but um, at, at Ideal Dialogue, you actually have a science offer, just like a science officer, just like they have uh, at Starship Enterprise, which I think is kind of funny. Absolutely. But you have somebody focused, officer. chief science officer. Um, 
what does the chief science officer do? Uh, that's a great question. And by the way, you can get quite geeky because uh, Dr. Jim Keaton would love that. Um, he is a, a fan of, of Star Trek. I will mention, however, he doesn't look at all like a Vulcan. <laughs> Though I have seen him wear a Vulcan costume, but I won't get into that hmm. at this this juncture. Uh, so everything we do is based in science. We are heavily steeped in the science of communication, and that's really what our foundation has been since we, we came out of the ground several years ago. We realized that in order to study uh, or uh, to make a difference, I should say, within uh, the customer support area that we're working in, we need to take a different avenue. And that was obviously from a marketing perspective, but also from what we're doing now isn't working, so we've got to try something different. And lo and behold, Jim Keaton, one of the uh, foremost researchers in the area of, of human communication, speech communication, uh, got to working with him, I should say. And we realized that this entire industry is based on two people having a conversation um, at some point. And so we started looking at it from 100 years of research and of, of speech communication and realized, lo and behold, that they have a lot to say about what it is we do every day. So by taking that science, we've been able to use it to define some things that are unique to our industry. Uh, for example, what is customer engagement on a personal level beyond engaging with the brand and engaging in different, but when it comes to two people talking, what is engagement? And we've defined it, it's dialogue. There's, there's um, a whole world out there of literature on dialogue, but we've been able to take that and define it uniquely for our industry. And by doing that and putting the science behind it, we now can predict uh, how people respond to people who achieve this level that we call dialogue. That, of course, was the genesis of the company Ideal Dialogue. There is an ideal way, if you will, of communicating between two people that causes things to happen you never would imagine. I'll geek out a little bit with you to say that there are things that happen in our brains uh, that are triggered naturally that there's not much we can do to stop when we have engaging conversations with people. A lot of research, if you're interested in reading up on things like mirror neurons and all of the, the state of the art of, of research today on how people pattern their behaviors when they get around each other, um, but all of it goes back to the, the brain and neural science is really beginning to uncover that there are chemistry uh, implications, chemical, there are all kinds of things going on in the brain. So what we are able to do is to tap into that science and help people through practical programs beyond training. It includes all sorts of aspects, including a system for hiring people who want to engage in the first place and, um, and training and, and all sorts of other things that we do around analytics um, to help us understand how best to communicate with customers. And in the end, what we hope is really that customers enjoy it the agent really enjoys it because they enjoyed connecting with somebody in a far off land. And then at the same time, of course, the company benefits from that engagement. So it's a win, win, win. And you talk about the science of, of how our brain works, which I think is incredibly fascinating. If somebody really checks out what you guys are doing, they're going to be really, I think, fascinated by some of the science behind building the relationship and how businesses can really benefit from understanding how as humans we want to connect. But the other thing that I think was really interesting too, and I, uh, is this idea that you guys actually have, it's another Star Trek uh, reference, but um, that you guys have a, a prime directive, basically, um, or something that you kind of call guiding principle, which is similar to Star Trek. Right. Yeah. Love it. I'm glad you're a Star Trek fan. Thank you. <laughs> it's uh, the, the prime directive, as we would call it in our world, is not prime directive. As you said, it's a guiding principle. Uh, we, we work with companies to form their own guiding principle, but we start with one for us, at least in working with everybody. And we believe this should be true for everyone. Our guiding principle is when a customer leaves talking to you, and by the way, we don't just work, I should have mentioned, we don't just work with people uh, over the phones and such and, and distance, but we, this works in a retail environment. We're talking about field service technicians. We're talking about all, all sorts of different people uh, communicating with other people. That when you're finished with your conversation, the brand should be better for it. It's really part of the guiding principle. There's another part to that guiding principle, which is no matter what happens, you should try to leave that person with a little bit of cheer and goodwill. So between those two, which is, again, really no matter what happens, your goal should be to leave that brand better than it was when somebody's coming in. And that, that 
can happen in a lot of different ways. We talk about the cable world. Um, we see a lot of that in, in today's world of, of I called and they show up on time or don't. We call, we call this uh, conversation that you have that, that really is good um, one that banks brand capital. So we call it a, a banking brand capital sort of conversation. And the, the way that works is pretty simple. When somebody calls in and orders a service and you're there to, to deliver it or send that package, and if I talk to that person and that conversation is horrible, I don't even know what happened, but I think I ordered a product. They took my credit card. Okay, great. And then the product doesn't show up or that person, field service person, doesn't show up to my door. What do I think? The first thing I think is something's really gone wrong here. But if we reverse that and think about my first conversation or one of them before my actions that I just described was positive. And I really felt like they treated me humanly. They connected with me. We say that banks brand capital because when somebody doesn't show up on time, you think to yourself in your brain, because you've connected things neurologically uh, and dopamines have kicked in and all kinds of fun things, that you now have a halo around the company. And so you give them a chance and you say, okay, all right, so they didn't show up on time. Let me give it another shot. So all of that ends up working together to, to talk about, I guess, go back to your point around um, how we want the uh, prime directive to be, and that is always, no matter what, keep that brand in a good light and find a way to work through it. Now, that's not easy. You have to have a lot of skill and a lot of training and, and a lot of systems, and, and, you know, there's a whole bunch behind it. If, that, if it were that easy, I wouldn't have a job, I guess, but... Another part of something that you guys do that I, I think, and this kind of is, is all in this idea of science that um, we've all complained, right? About getting transferred to, uh, first off, you have to get through this really long, uh, you know, switch of, 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 you know, getting through, pressing the right buttons. You finally get to somebody or maybe you get transferred to somebody and they're in a foreign country. And it isn't that they don't understand what you're saying because of a, a language barrier, but it's more of a, a culture barrier that I think is a bigger issue that people don't really understand that, um, that many of the outsourced call centers, I would say, probably for a lot of the, the big service providers or retailers um, are using uh, call centers where the agents aren't of the same social culture that we are. And so the conversation is awkward and complicated. And as consumers, we're frustrated what does ideal uh, dialogue do to kind of help um, customer service agents or call centers, whether they're outsourced or brand related, do to kind of overcome some of those obstacles? That's a great question. And it's funny you bring that up. I, I can't tell you how many airplane passengers I've sat next to who say, what do you do for a living? And the last thing I want to do is admit I work for call centers because you're going to hear every story that they've ever had uh, about bad experiences and, and, and get in detail and then want you to fix it. But um, that aside, you ask a great question. A lot of the the trend over the last really 15 years has been to put things in different markets or in different near showers, we call it. Um, Canada was a big area for a long time. And then certainly as we move south of the border, uh, and then over a period of time, we began to grow those uh, options into places like India and the Philippines. And there's probably not a country you couldn't point to on a map right now that isn't in some way engaged in a call center. Some of this has actually been quite positive. Um, it has done a lot of things for the industry in some good ways. And um, what we're working with people to do now is to realize that it can be a positive addition to what you're trying to do in your strategy with the company. However, you have to recognize that there are certain products and certain things you can do in some environments and not in others. So it starts immediately with having some sort of conceptual awareness or understanding of uh, where we're going uh, with this product. So brief example would be uh, you certainly would have difficulty having a culture support, say, mobile phones who've never had mobile phones in their culture, though many of them abroad now have, certainly have them. But there was a time when they didn't. And so when you're asking someone to support those phones and they've never heard of a phone before, that's going to be difficult from the beginning. So we have that. We also have what we call Ideal Voice, which is a um, selection system that we've built to help with determining whether somebody could be understand and whether they can understand somebody. So we've built several products and several processes to help try to get people to connect a little better across cultures. And I want to talk about just call centers in general and whether it makes sense to in-house all of your customer service or use out of house. And when is it appropriate to sell? I want to talk about multi-screens and I want to get to our panel. 
uh, because Ted, I know that you've got a lot more to add, and uh, I know you probably have some some clients that you can't personally speak to, but you've got a lot of interesting feedback in some of the conversations we've had in the space. But before we do get to the panel, I want to get to one of our sponsors, lynda.com. Lynda.com helps you keep up to date with new software, learn brand new skills, and explore new hobbies with easy to follow video tutorials. Whether you want to get tips on the latest online tools, improve your creative skills, or Learn how to attract and engage your customers with social media. Lynda.com offers thousands of video courses on a variety of topics. For any software you rely on, including Microsoft Office, Adobe Creative Cloud, Final Cut Pro, and more, Lynda.com helps you stay current with product updates and learn all the ins and outs of your software tools to be more efficient and productive in your professional and personal life. Lynda.com also offers 500 business courses. That's right, 500, including getting things done, negotiation, SEO fundamentals, blogging for your business, and Google AdWords essential training. Lynda.com recently released a new iPhone and iPad app for iOS 7 and enhanced their Android app and provide Chromecast support. The iOS app includes more visual, intuitive interface, and both apps offer offline courses and video viewing, which allows you to learn more in any environment moving seamlessly between mobile and desktop applications. And on the topic of today's show, they also have courses on customer service fundamentals and building stronger connections with digital media. I know that this is a landscape that changes all the time. I mean, especially in the digital space, there's all kinds of new software. We're always coming across some sort of challenge and obstacle, whether it's a PR nightmare or more. Just understanding how to do digital marketing is an ongoing training. And maybe you need to take the training for yourself to stay up to date and maybe get the next big job. Or maybe you don't have time to train your entire staff all the time. So you encourage them to go to lynda.com to stay up to date and better take care of your customers. With over 2,700 courses with more added weekly, all lynda.com courses are produced at the highest quality, not like some of the homemade videos you see on YouTube. lynda.com works with software companies to provide you with update training and the same day new versions hit the market. So you'll always have the very latest in skills. At lynda.com, the instructors are accomplished professionals at the top of their field. Courses for all experience levels, including beginner, intermediate, and advanced. So don't worry about where you fall in the learning curve. Courses, like I said, are for all levels. So for me, I might be at a different level than you, but you know, that's okay. Nobody knows, and you're going to continue to learn and become, yep, the most advanced. Watch from your computer, tablet, or mobile device. Whether you have 15 minutes or 15 hours, each course is structured so you can learn from start to finish. You can also search the transcripts to find quick answers or read along with the video. Lynda.com offers certificates of completion, which is a really great thing that you can add to your LinkedIn profile to show people that you're continuing to learn. Learn something new with Lynda.com. It's only $25 a month for access to the entire Lynda.com course library. Or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's projects using exact same assets. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash mm to access the entire library. That's over 2,700 courses free for seven days. And it's all at lynda, L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash mm. And thank you to lynda.com for your support of Marketing Mavericks. So... More discussion on the evolution of customer care and marketing and sales with um, our guest today, Ted Narden. We're also joined by Augie Ray. Augie, welcome back to the show. The Director of Voice Strategy at a Fortune 100 financial company. And Frank Eliason, who is the Director of Global Social Media at City and the author of At Your Service. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having us. <laughs> so, Okay. Um, I know you guys are just chomping at the bit to jump into this conversation. You've both written blogs and probably what really brought this to our attention this week to really focus on this subject is Comcast and um, the the phone call that was heard around the world, I think is what you called it, Frank, right? Um, and, and 
and The Verge keeps writing stories. They've interviewed 100 Comcast employees. But I have to say, and I've worked in the cable industry myself for many years prior to becoming, uh, working at Twit, and that is that, that everybody loves to hate uh, the service providers, especially their cable company. Everybody loves to hate their cable company. So, I, I you know, I think a part of this is just our deep-seated feeling about what we consider a monopoly but I also think there's a change that's happening in customer service and sales and marketing where it's much more relationship focused than it ever has been. And when we have employees who we challenge to meet results, we also have to make sure that they're listening and understanding the customer. So what do you, what do you say? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to start with you, Frank, since you actually used to work for, for Comcast uh, yourself. In fact, you launched Comcast cares. Um, what do you think about everything that's been in the news lately about them or any uh, major brand, whether it's a service provider or a retailer, having the kind of phone call that they did and, and the scrutiny that we're all giving it. That phone call was horrible. Um, you know, what I'll say is, first of all, it's not just a Comcast problem. Comcast is the poster child for bad service right now. But the fact is, a lot of call centers are broken in the same way. We've been thinking of customer service the same way we have for the past 10, 20 years. You know, and that's what I loved about Ted's company. They're thinking differently. They're thinking about that relationship aspect. But most companies are not. They're thinking of operational aspects. How can I sell you more? How can I, you know, get you on and off my phone? Because I hate having customers call me. This is the theme that you typically see. Uh, in call centers, and you know, we we view it as a poor operation. There go my lights. So uh, they're back on now. Sorry about that. I love it when it's live. Uh, but the fact is, that is what call centers have been about for a long time. Things like handle time, measuring the wrong things. As soon as I heard that retention call, I knew he was measured on save rate, and the save rate was based upon if that customer hung up the phone and did not get rid of any services, he wins. Exactly. And that's how employees are compensated. And, and there's a measurement, you know, I've, I've ran, you know, you probably won't like me when I tell you this, but I've ran telemarketing and, and outsourced, you know, phone calls to try to upgrade customers. And there's some really strict, uh, you know, sales numbers they have to reach, but that was then, right. And so customers that didn't like that wouldn't necessarily have a, an avenue to talk about it. What do you say about that, Ted? I mean, are, should companies have a different set of, of, of rules for, for call center employees today, sales or retention agents today versus what they, where they had it 10 years ago? Well, and th this is, you're exactly right on all the conversation, by the way, about things being the same the last 10 or 20 years. One of the things that, that leads directly to that is that we've really treated things as a, um, uh, how do we get more out of the customer support mm -hmm. arena? But yet that's coupled with how do we control it? Um, we have 10,000 agents maybe. Some people don't realize this, but companies that are large like the Comcast of the world have thousands and thousands of agents taking calls at any given moment. And for an executive, that sweat breaks out on your forehead thinking about what could possibly go wrong, you know? So how do I control it? And I think you start putting all these measures in place and you start doing a lot of those things to try to control what we really want to do naturally, which is talk. So um, it's bound to go wrong on occasion, but what I think really happens is we end up probably pushing it the other way to keep it from going wrong, which may drive it more wrong in the end. So, um, you know, it's it's an interesting circle in that, Ted, that we space. Made it we made it a process, process, process. And, you know, unfortunately, we forgot to give the customer that side of the process. You know, they didn't have the script either, so they can't keep up with things. And they don't even know the right things to say to keep on script. You know, this is the problem to service. And it's, you know, the fact is, it's not brain surgery. You know, think like a customer. How do you want to be treated? It's not that hard, but we make it so difficult because of the way we keep going at it and we keep trying to to get the costs and costs down further, further, further. The other thing that eats at me, though, is we also talk very much about, you know, lowering those costs. So, you know, we want to push our customers to the web, you know, so we don't have to talk to them. People have to think about the message they're now sending to their own employees. Customers, bad, bad. They call us. They're bad. That doesn't create a great environment either. Uh, ultimately, we have to get, you know, the right environment. If you create that right experience, you know, the fact is that customer may not call that often. But you know what? If you get to the point where a customer only calls once a year, 
you better hit a home run in that experience because you know you're not that's your only chance to really shine and hit that human connection uh and so i tell companies be careful what they wish for I think it kind of is brain surgery because we are having to rewire the way that we've trained employees and the way that we um, hold them accountable, right? I mean, we are having to reconfigure our, our, our training. We're having to, to, to understand as a, a leader in our organization what, um, what the mentality is that we're passing down to our employees. And I think, so let's think about the CEO of a major brand, right? So, I, if I'm the CEO of, of a product and I, I care very much about the, the success of our company, I'm thinking about how to make customers like us more, especially if I'm in marketing, right? I want to make customers sell. I want to make customers buy. But if I am the head of a potential outsourcer, am I really thinking about making the customer love my product more? Or am I thinking about our handle times? Am I thinking about how quickly we need to move the call on or the, the bottom line numbers? I mean, what do you say about that? Ted, Augie, you're muted, by the way. You muted yourself. <laughs> so, Ted, so while, Augie, while Augie's okay. trying to unmute himself, um, he says he's not muted. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I could try to interpret for him, if you'd like. Maybe <laughs> go go jump in, Ted. There you go. Okay. It's Augie's going to sign his answer. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I, I've spent uh, about 12 years working in the outsource side of this as well. I've been on, on all sides of the equation, and I can tell you that it's, it's not easy. Um, but what I can tell you is that outsourcers behave as other companies contract them to behave. So it's not necessarily that you, you look yep. at outsourcing as an evil. Um, they can do great things. Uh, for example, we're working with one company now who's outsourcing to another company. And they brought us in to help figure out what the best way is in order to leverage that outsourcer. Now, they're not outsourcing for price necessarily. What they're outsourcing for is because that's not what they do. It goes back to the old stick to your knitting. Um, they are a product uh, company. They produce a wonderful product, but they don't want to have to support it. So they're hiring people that have been doing it for a quarter of a century to say, help us do it. And in, and in contracting the right way with them and setting it up the right way, you change that. They don't have necessarily necessarily that that view that you just described which is uh, I don't really care about your customers I just want money instead they're looking at it as we're in this together and it can be done you partner with your you know these are your partners treat them as such you know if you have the right contracts with them and you're measuring the right things you can get great results unfortunately most of the time we're measuring efficiencies and cost as opposed to customer satisfaction uh, repeat calls. Are they calling us back or do we get it right the first time? You know, the, the metrics themselves that you build into the contract will determine what you get out of it. So am I on yet? Yeah, you're on. <laughs> that was probably killing you. Voice. I was just going to sit here silently and smile the whole time. And, <laughs> That's and, so and not I would you. appear smarter because I'm with these gentlemen. <laughs> um, so the, here's the issue is that I keep hearing us talking about process and cost cutting, but the Comcast call was equally about something else, which is making customer service people responsible for something other than offering service and making people happy. It is clear that, as Frank mentioned, that he was compensated for sales. And we have this mentality now where everyone's being turned into a sales representative of the organization, which is great if you're in sales and people know that they're interacting with you because they are in a sales situation. It is not great when somebody calls because they have a problem. Um, and, you know, you have to do that very delicately. Um, I have seen companies that will compensate people for sales saves, uh, customer service people for sales saves only if that customer rates the interaction highly, which seems a safer way, for instance. But I still think we're on thin ice any time that we take mm. somebody who is supposed to be making people happy by being responsive to their needs and making them responsible for selling to somebody because that is a, a, a real problem. And, and so I think there's a mentality that goes beyond simply we've got to train right and we have to make sure that people understand how much we care about people. Um, you can't turn the entire organization into sales. You know, and what right. I'm hearing over and over again sounds like company culture. And that comes from the top down and how 
we truly, I think Tony Shea is a great example who um, really instilled uh, this idea with his employees that to care about the customer, to listen to the customer, not that the customer is always right, but certainly to treat them with respect and listen to them and, and take care of their needs. Um, how come more, I mean, this has been years that, that, you know, Tony wrote his first book and, and here, you know, we are still talking about this. There's so many companies that haven't really grasped how to build a better culture. Why is that? Yeah, well, there's so I'm, many. I'm, I'm, <laughs> well, that's so many a popular one. That. That one. I'm, I'm curious about what, what you guys will say to this, but one of the challenges of using Tony as an example is that Zappos, to my knowledge, wasn't profitable, right? I mean, he could talk a good game about we're all committed and we've got free overnight shipping and you know anyone can return anything and we and we let our employees rip up the conference rooms and decorate whatever they want, but he was not profitable. You know, he built a a lot of revenue and Amazon bought them, another company that loves to to build revenue over profit. But, you know, what you have to do is find better examples, I think, of organizations <laughs> that build profit while still being committed to that. We're filled with lots of examples, but I do find both those companies fascinating because if you really look at their service model, you know, Zappos is 800 number all over the place. Please call us. We want to hear from you. Amazon is... If you called us, we screwed up. We, you know, our website didn't do it right. We didn't get it right. Uh, and so two different approaches, but with the same end, end uh, results. But what I'll also say, though, I agree that, you know, they're not necessarily the right models. But there are right models out there. You know, I look at that show, Undercover Boss. If you've ever watched it, you know, it's kind of funny. We all laugh at it. With this, There's always these things where they're sitting with some phone rep and it's a hard call and the rep gets fired or, you know, whatever. Uh, the fact is we don't have that enough. Our senior executives aren't walking into call centers to listen to calls. They're going in there to say speeches. They're going in there to get everybody excited. They're not listening to the reality. Then in business, we tend not to share the reality upward. What do we share upward? Look at how great we are. We just did X as opposed to here's how we could help this company be better. Uh, we have to change the way we speak inside companies. And, you know, it needs to allow this free information to flow. Call centers can actually probably help best, you know, create the best products and, you know, evaluate what's really happening. But you have to partner with them. You have to give them a trusted means that they can actually talk to you. Uh, senior executives need to be listening to these calls regularly, not just what's fed to them. You know, years ago, we used to work in, in quality assurance. We had to look for the perfect call. We would spend about 120 hours just looking for the perfect call to share with the CEO. That was never an efficient use of time. It was ridiculous. As soon as that call, yeah, it happens all the time. And as soon as we got that um, leader was no longer part of that service department, this was not a Comcast prior to that, we started sharing the real upward. And guess what? Light bulbs went on for the CEO. That's what really happens? Yes, it's what's been happening for years. And guess what? Then change happened. All kinds of change happened. You know, the fact is these agents have the story of your brand at their fingertips. They can share it with you. They can share it on The Verge. Uh, or they can share it directly to your customer. Where do you want it to be shared? Depends on what that story is. I don't necessarily know it's what you think it is. I think, you know, customers call in looking for some sort of advice. Maybe they're upset, but sometimes it's the technology that makes them more upset. So really complicated oh. IVRs being, you know, having to push lots of different buttons just to try to get to somebody, finally speak to somebody. And then, you know, then you're put on hold. And so it seems like, it seems like um, a really long time before you get to actually talk to somebody about your why about your problem or, or your question. Why, Ted, you can maybe address this. Why do we have this really complicated system of routing customers around and giving them the third degree and asking them everything from their mother's maiden name, their social security number, most of the time to just have to repeat that information once they're finally connected to a live person? Well, that would be called a broken system. Uh, what, when it works right, it works beautifully. There are people who, um, certainly it's not our expertise, but I, I've been in that line of, of work before. 
uh, who can set up brilliant systems for them. But what they're really trying to do in this process is really accomplish two things. One is to reduce customer effort. Um, that is usually the noble cause. It doesn't end up, as you described, a lot of times ending up. It just doesn't get there. But that's the noble goal everybody has. If we can reduce their effort, we do a couple things. We reduce uh, their churn, hopefully, as customers. And, and also, of course, we reduce calls to the call center, deflect them, and, and save costs. So hopefully we're all winners. But when it goes wrong, it goes miserably wrong. And, uh, yeah, I've been through that many times. There's nothing like punching in every number that you have in your entire life and get to an agent who who says, how can I help you? And you tell them, they say, great, give me your number, you know, or give them whatever numbers you need. And that's because the systems are disconnected and disjointed. I will say technology has come a long way. And I have, I've experienced some companies uh, here recently who some, just absolutely done some wonderful things in routing calls and have gotten me exactly to the person who, by the way, helped me the last time. So they're doing, there are companies way on that edge who are able to look at the number I, I'm calling, look at who helped me last, and look through 5,000 agents and see if they happen to be logged in and put me in their personal queue. That's pretty neat, you know, because they remembered me. Um, so I'm impressed. Most of the time, I'm not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I heard some snickering there. I don't know if that was you, Augie, or, or what. But are we seeing the impact of bad customer service? I mean, as a marketer, I think we work really hard on creative campaigns. In fact, I think it's Discover Card who has... Their, their complete advertising uh, campaign around, you know, calling into customer service and the, the person on the other end makes them feel so comfortable that they just forgot why they were calling because it was such a great experience. That never happens. I mean, come on. And, and are we actually seeing um, customers not use our service or, or run to sign up for our service because they feel like they had a superior or inferior customer experience? Augie? Oh, did we lose him again? <laughs> <laughs> Augie, try wow. sock puppets. You got to go for the sock puppets. <laughs> of course. The one that's probably the <laughs> most outspoken of the gag is the one that can't speak. So, you know, I'll take that. Um, you okay, know, Frank. Are we seeing it? Yes. You know, I think we do see it in a few different ways. First of all, all of a sudden, um, my lights go out. See, his he stops talking and my lights go out. <laughs> I, I, I can't it's even science. figure this It's science. It's sci-fi, right? It is sci-fi. <laughs> so I'm going to talk in this glow. It's going to be really quite interesting. But, you know, what I would say is we are seeing the fact that customers have realized they do control a brand image. You know, we saw it with the incident that happened with Comcast. We saw it with the incident that happened with Southwest Airlines. Um, you know, ultimately, there's been incidents galore where the customer all of a sudden took control over the brand and the brand image online. Now, is that leading to lost sales or lost revenue? Not usually. It's usually la you, people laughing at it more than anything else. But it is something that is it's changing how we do business. And we have to recognize that, that flip in control that the consumer now has. It's no longer some message you push. It is the business reality of here's the way you treat me. Here's how you talk to me as a person. So, you know, that is what we actually have going on. Uh, and, and I think that what it's going to cause for marketing to consider is you can't send a message that's not true. You know, it, it, talk about your, if your experience is great, fine. It better be great when I call uh, or else I'll have your brand uh, and I'll take it, you know, on Twitter. I'll take it to wherever else I decide to. I want to talk about that experience with Southwest Airlines and how their customer service agent um, handled a customer experience. I want to talk about that as well as other second screen things. But I first want to get to another sponsor for Marketing Mavericks, which is ZipRecruiter uh, and their support. So, okay, my question. Are you hiring? Most people are. Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? Well, posting your job in one place isn't enough to find quality candidates. If you want to find the perfect hire, you need to post your job on all of the top job sites. And now you can. With ZipRecruiter.com, you post your job to 50 plus job sites, including Craigslist, LinkedIn, and Twitter, with all with one single click. Find the candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Just post once and watch your qualified candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. No juggling emails or calls to your office. 
Quickly screen candidates, rate them, and hire the right person fast. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 200,000 businesses. Right now, our listeners could try ZipRecruiter for free for a four-day trial. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash MM. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash MM. And we thank ZipRecruiter for your support of Marketing Mavericks. ZipRecruiter, great service. And the idea that you can handle it all um, by one click is kind of amazing because we're all busy people, especially trying to find the right person. So thank you, ZipRecruiter. And uh, thanks, guys, for, for you know all of your conversation. Hopefully, Augie, we have you back on. Are you still muted? I don't know. Am I on? Can you hear me? <laughs> can you hear me now? That sounds yeah, like a Verizon I commercial. Can so, okay, uh, Frank, right before uh, you mentioned this idea that this 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 viral, I know people hate that word, but a, a, a conversation that Southwest Airlines had with one of their customers went viral because the customer tweeted about it and then tweeted afterwards what happened. And it was the Southwest Airlines kicked off, uh, a man was kicked off a plane because he tweeted a complaint. Um, what happened, at least his side of the story, is that um, he was a premium customer. He wasn't allowed to take his kids on board with him at the time that he was supposed to enter. They said, nope, you can go, but your kids have to stay. Well, whether you agree with that or not, what happened was he said, you know, I'm going to tweet about this when I get on the plane. And so he did. What then happened was that Southwest Airlines approached him and said, you have to get off the plane. They escorted him and his two children off the plane and said, if you want to get back on the plane, you have to delete your tweet. Well, that doesn't sound very free country to me. I mean, if you're a customer, you should be able to talk about what it is that's bothering you. And there's certainly some other stories. But let's talk about that one really quick. And I think this idea that a, a brand or a business, um, especially, I mean, maybe the agent felt like they were going to get in trouble, so they handled it this way. But guess what? What could have been a non-issue and nobody would have ever heard about everyone heard about and everyone now has this impression that Southwest Airlines is more controlling and it will kick you off a plane just because you tweet about your customer experience. What, what do you say about that, Augie? You've been keeping quiet. Well, assuming I can be heard. Can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you. Okay. Um, you know, it's funny though. I Listen, I I want to believe in the word of mouth of, of the customer. I really do. And, and I think there is damages that occur when these sorts of things happen with you know no brand likes to be pulled off of message there are pr expenses that are incurred the fact of the matter is is that nobody who saw this will choose a more expensive flight or a less convenient itinerary sure. on a southwest competitor because they saw about that tweet. It just won't happen. No one's going to spend $50 more or take two hops instead of one hop because wow that southwest really damaged the, you know, their reputation with me. So there's a part of me that says, I think we can make too much of this and we always make too mm -hmm. much of it. Um, and so it's not that it's not a little painful. It's not that there are no expenses. It's not that it's no issue. Um, I, in fact, I think maybe one of the things we could explore uh, on another show perhaps um, is whether all of this actually uh, has to do with damaging the brand or whether it has more to do with damaging the reputations of individuals within an organization. Um, does it work at the brand level or does it work within uh, at the peer level? And I think maybe it works more at the peer level. Nobody nobody wants to have this stuff happen on their watch. It's embarrassing to, to sit in a meeting, you know, in front of the president and all of your peers and have them ask what the hell is going on. Um, nonetheless, I, I see very little evidence that it actually damages brands. And I think that's interesting because honestly what it says is that a, consumer attitudes and behaviors are actually much harder to change than sometimes we act. Um, and B, there is simply an expectation of parity. It happened on Southwest this time. It doesn't mean it won't happen on United next time. They're all the same, right? I mean, isn't that what everyone's attitude is? And so um, I actually think the negative stuff doesn't necessarily harm brands the way we think it does or says it does. But I still think the positive stuff matters because it's the personal word of mouth that matters. It isn't the, guy, the one person that you don't know who who is 20 degrees separated from you who had the bad uh, experience, it's your friend who says, man, I flew JetBlue and what a great experience. I think that stuff matters yet. Uh, some of the negative stuff, I think we just love to snark. That's all. I I don't know about that. And I think that we should have the right as consumers to be able to, to you know, if we have an issue with a brand or our experience with a, 
you know, as, 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 a, as, a, as a business owner, I think I should have the right to say I want to serve somebody or not serve them, um, you know, based on, you know, certainly something legitimate. And, and if, if I've posted a bunch of bad Yelp reviews <laughs> and, and, the, and the restaurant owner doesn't want to serve me another burger, well, you know, I think they should have the right to do that. But there's a company, um, actually, the New York Post reported on um, a hotel that said it was the Union Street Guest Hotel. And they are actually fining brides who have their weddings at their hotel if if one of their attendees, um, one of their guests, uh, says something bad on Yelp, the bride gets fined $500. Now, how are they going to follow up on that? I don't know. But for every bad Yelp review, the, the bride gets fined $500. I think that's crazy because you don't have control over your guests. I mean, everybody has a voice. What do you say about that? I mean, it's it's handling customer service on Yelp in a really bad way. I think going onto Yelp and and trying to service the issue that the customer had seems more logical than trying to find your actual customer for something that their guest had to say. What do you say about that? Well, I think what, right off I could say they must close the cash bar early. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know how you. I don't know how you control that. <laughs> it would be rough. Well, it's, you know, if you look, look they have five hundred and forty-one star reviews after that New York Post came out. Uh, so that really worked out to be a brilliant policy decision. Uh, you know, it really changed how they felt about on Yelp because they got rid of those negative reviews. Now they have more than probably any other place in the area. Uh, and they've lost total control um, simply because of that policy. But at the end of the day, I don't know. I really have never heard of them either. I kind of agree with Augie that, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff, we make a big deal out of a lot of these things. And, yes, it does have hurt feelings. Uh, but at the same time, does it really change what happens Uh I don't necessarily know. For that company, I think what's going to change, the reason it will change is people aren't going to want to go there and potentially be charged $500 for something outside their control. It's a dumb policy. Uh, but this whole, you know, going crazy out on the web about this, I don't think that's that big of a deal. Yeah, well, well I'll, I will say that I, I moderate my, uh, I'm going to give you a caveat, which is small business. I think small business can rise with with great ratings. I think small business can get hurt with bad ratings. Uh, I certainly think businesses that tend to get evaluated by ratings. Uh, so I don't know anyone who goes to look at Southwest Air's ratings on Yelp. Probably nobody does when they make a decision. Uh, but they will when they go for a restaurant or go to stay somewhere, look at the hotel ratings. And so I think hotels and restaurants are a little different. Uh, and so you, we do have to be a little, I, I can be a little broad sometimes, I recognize, but uh, there are uh, there are caveats and there are verticals, uh, particularly among small business where all this stuff matters. The, the interesting thing about all this is that there is no way on God's green earth that that was an enforceable thing anyway. So this hotel went through all this pain to make some point that they that they demonstrably lost on. And at no time did they have any opportunity to actually avail themselves of this ridiculous fee. They would have lost. Which, I, yeah, they couldn't really enforce. And and there's some rumors that it's a publicity stunt, although I think they just, uh, they probably were worried about the bad press. But, you know, is uh, is any PR and any publicity good for your business? What do you say about that? Well, I went it's back and looked at United Breaks much. Guitars and wrote about it and found that uh, United Stock well outperformed any of their competitors after United Breaks Guitars. If you go back and look at Bank of America on Bank Transfer Day uh, and look at what happened to their stock, their their stock wildly outperformed everyone else. I, I tend not to be a believer necessarily in that any PR is good PR, but um, I think when you go back to some of these things that the talking heads will sometimes use in conferences or in blog posts to be representative of times when brands have really hurt themselves, if you really go back and look at what happened to the company, it's very very, very hard to find examples where it actually did hurt. So uh, this company, though, you know, if I'm going to stay up in Hudson, New York, and I see a bunch of one-star reviews, that's that really hurts. So there, and I'm, Augie, you've talked about this more than probably anybody. There are times where we feel like we don't have a lot of options, whether it's flying on a specific airline or, you know, maybe we're stuck at the airport and we're at the car rental counter and there just aren't any other options. I think one of the most famous scenes of bad customer service is from planes, trains, and automobiles when Steve Martin was complaining at the customer care counter for the auto rental car. And he 
I mean, am I old enough? Am I the old oldest one here that's gonna remember <laughs> remember that remember. movie? Mom's gonna do the turkey. <laughs> yeah, Dad wants ambrosia, so I guess we gotta get those gotta get those miniature marshmallows. And I'll do the crescent rolls and you do the cranberries. You know I can't cook. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'll see you tomorrow then. Gobble, gobble. <laughs> oh, bye bye. Yeah, we should probably. <laughs> we should probably be careful because there's no telling what he's going to say next. But I've, I've often felt when I called into a call center and got put on hold that they might have been finishing a conversation they were having about what they did last night and what they're going to do next. And I suddenly didn't feel like they really cared about me as a customer. And that, again, is a perception that I think customers have is that they don't, the person on the other end of the phone doesn't really care about us. What do you say about that, Ted? I mean, is that something that really happens or, oh, are, are we losing Augie there? <laughs> No, I'm showing you I don't care to see. I was representing. I thought all, all three of us would do it simultaneously, actually. Is that something yeah. that happens, Ted? Uh, yeah. It, and, you know, first of all, again, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of conversations going on at any given minute. Things are going to happen. I can tell you what one of the other aspects of our business is to, um, you know, monitor calls. And we do that in using uh, screen capture where we can also see what the agent's doing. And there are cases with companies where we, we see it all the time where they're selling items on eBay while they're helping somebody. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're texting friends about how much they're looking for another job. So certainly that goes on and you hear it in their voice. But by and large, in most organizations, they hire people who they believe are going to represent the brand and are going to have a care and concern concern for the customer. Um, you know, no, I, I shouldn't say nobody. I mean, but anybody who cares how they're hiring isn't hiring somebody that just is going to walk in and do a poor job. So somewhere between somebody um, having that skill set and delivering that skill set, something goes wrong. And I'll just give you a quick example. We always bring this up and we talk about, but you think about how often in life we help people for absolutely free. Um, talk about uh, Dr. Jim Keaton with us. He always tells a story about he was out jogging one day and a car came by and uh, was and parked and it was a, a woman in there looking at a map and she had three kids in the back and you could tell she's probably trying to get to a birthday party or something and looking distressed, didn't know what to do and he kind of jogged over and said, can I help you? <clears throat> she said, yeah, I'm trying to find this location. And he said, oh, you just missed it. Go right back over here. You're almost there. You'll be fine. And she had this look of thank you. And, and, and he said, now, if she had reached in and said, here's a $5 bill, thank you, he would have been thoroughly offended because he did it out of the goodness of his heart. And so there's a, there's a certain caring gene in us. There's, uh, all of us want to show some care and concern, but somewhere between doing it for free on a regular basis and now being paid for it, something goes awry. And we all of a sudden get paid sometimes very good money to do support and we just don't deliver it. So the question is, what in the organization is driving that? What is it within the job structure? All of those things that, that we've been talking about that goes awry. Yep. So what do we good need point. to, yeah, I mean, so what do we need then to change to all be consistent, whether it's, you know, creating a chief science officer or, <laughs> or engaging in, in really the brain surgery as Frank uh, would maybe call it. <laughs> Uh, and helping us understand better how to do things different. Because I've always said that we're all in sales. Everybody that works for the company is in sales, whether you're a technician, whether you're um, a customer service agent. And so I think we do need to all sell, but I also think that we need to be better understand how that works in the relationship with the customer. So how do we do that? Well, I, I look I, at it as you hire people that, that want to do it, first of all. I mean, not all of us want to carry on 35 conversations a day, 40 conversations a day. We just don't. There are people who want to do it, and there are people who are forcing themselves to do it. And you can tell the difference immediately on a, on a call. But the other thing is that you've got to realize that not everybody is a salesperson. So we have to realize that, as I think it was Augie was mentioning earlier, that we force people to do things, that, that we put them in sales positions, we work with people in ways that they don't want to work. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, who, who's the problem here? Is it us or the people we're hiring? And more likely it's us that, that are managing these folks. So hire great people, put them in a position that they feel like they can be themselves. And, and I'll put that as the last point um, on that for me that's huge. And that is, 
it, you really put somebody in place and say, we want you to do this job and we want you to sound human and we want you to connect with these people and we want you to engage. And here's a script telling you exactly how to do it. So word for word, read these things and connect. Or we go out there and we say, communicate better, you know? And what we don't realize is communication is something we, we just, it's the most complicated thing there is to do, to, to get across easily. Yet we think it's easy because we've been doing it since we were, you know, born. Um, so I, I think all of that comes together to make it that it, we really have to realize it's hiring the right person, putting them in the right environment, and then giving them um, the ability to go communicate the right way. Augie, what do you say? I mean, as leaders, well, what do you think we should do? Yeah, see, I can't uh, I can't be on a call about customer service and not mention USAA since I worked at USAA. Uh, and I think the missing ingredient often is purpose. It's mission. Uh, at USAA, they hire people out of the military community. A third of the people they hire uh, either served or have members who are serving in the military. Uh, they serve people in the military. They don't try to serve everyone. Uh, they, they have a focus. They have a mission. Um, if you stop somebody in the hallway of USAA and ask them what the corporate mission is, uh, they will be able to repeat it back for you word for word. They start employee meetings with the mission. And the mission is to serve uh, those who serve. The mission is to help those people who have served their country secure their financial future. And they believe in that. And they believe in it so much that uh, when they do quarterly updates to employees, the first slide is not, here's our ROI, here's how we've reduced costs, here's our, our profit and how much it's up. It is, here's how we are doing to the mission. And by the way, if we achieve our mission, we also achieve the financial results. And so I actually think that a sense of purpose, a sense of mission is something that gets too often overlooked and can be easily buried by the things that Frank and Ted have talked about, which is call handling time, sales quotas, you know, fast, 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 sell, sell, sell. Uh, the, you know, people want to belong to something more than that. They want to do something. They want to help people. I agree with Ted. People have this gene. They want to help people. And then you put them down with a quota and it all goes out the window. So I think leading with some sort of a passionate mission uh, is things that, that people like Zappos and USA uh, excel at. So how do we measure employees? How do we measure the productivity of our employees to make sure that whether, you know, is it handle time? Is it the number of of people they were able to save, you know, much like the Comcast call that we talked about. I mean, how do we, how do we measure performance then? Well, I think, it, you know, first of all, you know, USA is a great example. I'm a USA member and I love them. I use Vanguard Investments as another example, but both those companies are kind of mutually owned. And, you know, there's definitely a different structure where most other companies let's face it, are serving their shareholders or trying to make a profit. Uh, so there are some differences out there. Uh, I personally believe most companies should have a chief customer officer uh, and be have a much deeper focus. You hire towards your culture. Um, unfortunately, many companies don't have a real distinct culture. Zappos has a distinct culture, which we talked about earlier. So does Amazon. So does uh, USA. So does Vanguard. You know, so you know, you hire towards your culture and how that fits in towards your mission. Uh, and so I think that's one way to achieve it. I think what's often missing is we're failing to listen. Uh, you know, our call centers, we're not listening to the customer. We're trying to rush them off the phone as fast as we can. Uh, now back to your actual question, since I almost got completely away from that. You, you know, the way I revamped the call center at one point, we got rid of things like handle time. Um, we got rid of pretty much all metrics that were operationally driven. Uh, with the exception of uh, something we refer to as staff time, which is, hey, are you in your seat when you're supposed to be? But it was only about being in your seat when you're supposed to be, and we tried to keep that even flexible. Uh, but what we measured was that promoter score. Now, that did not mean uh, you're going to do a survey after this call. If you don't give me a 10, you're going to take food off my table. Did not mean that, um, but we would we did survey customers after the fact. So we did look at net promoter score. What we found, which was interesting, was you know people gave lower net promoter score when calls were really extraordinarily long and not adding value to their life. Um, you know, some long calls are actually good. Customer loves it, and the the company it's fine for the company. But there's others that are long and just not efficient. 
Uh, and so we found actually uh, customer survey would actually you know give negative scores there. So it actually helped to keep handle time down. Uh, so if you go to the traditional metrics, the other thing we looked at was repeat calls. You know, if a customer calls back within a certain period of time, depending on your product, we use 30 days. I know some other products might be one week, some others might be 60 days, whatever it may be. Uh, how often does that is that customer calling back? Did you take care of everything during that call? So these are ways to think about our own call handling and our own call metrics. But I do think the, the biggest challenge is we need to get listening at all levels of the organization, uh, listening to the customer when they're on the phone, but also listening to our employees. We Going back to the Comcast example, to me, that was a lack of listening and understanding of the employee and what that customer experience was. You know, it's, it's one of the real reasons I'm a big fan of chief customer officers to understand that experience and actually guide that organization. Well, I think we still have a lot to do. And I think the second screen and third screen definitely has an impact on customer service. I know, Frank, you, you started the initiative uh, with Comcast, Comcast Cares, and a lot has happened since that day. Are we still where we need to be when it comes to social media and the customer service we provide, whether it's over Twitter or Facebook or some other sort of customer service channel? I mean, how much have we grown in that space? Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll just say right offhand, you know, in watching what's going on with Comcast, it's obviously failed. Uh, they ha weren't fixing. These are the same things we were hearing from Comcast back in 2007. We were fixing it and things reverted back to where they were um, at some point after I left. That can't be the case. Uh, you know, social media customer service, not about social media customer service, it never was. If you study the, the complaints that are out there, it's people that are already contacting you through other channels uh, and you failed them. You failed them over the phone, you failed them on your website, you failed them other places. Then they turn to social media. So the fact is we need to be taking this information and fixing what is broken would cause them the need to do that in the first place. It doesn't really scale having everybody, you know, blasting your brand and social media just because you give them better service that way. Not the way to think about things. It's not the way customers really want it. Customers want it service right. They want, first of all, the product to work without any uh, interaction. But when it didn't work, they tried to contact you and, you know, you failed there. Fix it. Anybody else have any comments on that? I'll just say that um, one of the things we haven't done that I, I think we aspire to is to make the support center the nerve center for the company. And mm -hmm. I, I don't say that because I hope it all revolves around our profession. But if you look at where we're headed today, everything has to come into one nerve center, all the information, all the points of contact. And we get all these disparities between different modes, different uh, ways of, of reaching the customer. And uh, I think they end up, a lot of what Frank's saying is, is tied up in the fact that we've got people running in different directions and not fixing the problem because they didn't pull all the data together in one place. I have to say that, you know, we've talked about Comcast as a theme throughout the show and this um, article that was written, I did ask the the writer of the story the, that's been following uh, Comcast and as, has reported on on all of the interviews they've had to be a part of the show, but um, but was unable to make it that I think that it's a much more complicated um, answer than just paying attention mm -hmm. and building relationships with customers. I and mean, if you read the report, it was, you know, services need to be the same all across and just there's so many other business issues at hand that can't be explained in a little bit of journalism. But I think that it is interesting that we're talking about it because it's something that we need to focus on. And and it, and because of the way that we interact with customers on many different screens and at many different levels, we really do need to build better relationships. I love what you guys are doing, Ted, at um, at uh, Dialogue. And um, I'm excited to see the science about what comes more. So, um Anybody have any final parts? I guess I should ask, Augie, if somebody, now, I'm assuming you're not on mute. If somebody wants to connect with you, what's the best way they can do that? <laughs> he is on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to write it on a, on a, etch a sketch or something? The there? one person that should not be muted is Augie. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, what is he doing? Is he writing it down? Hey, you know, him doing that, by the way, I don't know if you've watched Let's Ask America, but isn't that what they do? <laughs> <laughs> At Augie Ray. Oh, that's perfect. What is that on the back of your Comcast bill? 
<laughs> and Ted, if somebody wants to connect with you, what's the best way they can do that? Uh, they can get me on LinkedIn or certainly at idealdialogue.com. And one of these days we'll get you on Twitter. I will. <laughs> and Frank, if they want to connect with you and uh, maybe check out your book, what's the best way they can do that? Please check out my book. Uh, but, you know, best way of getting in contact with me, Twitter at Frank Eliason or LinkedIn uh, or even email. My email is frank at frankeliason.com. And I do love to talk about these service challenges or even how to drive uh, the story upward to drive change. You know, it, it does start with a story. And I think it, the power is in each one of us to drive our organizations in the right direction. Uh, but it's doing it in the right way. Share the customer story in the customer's own words. You know, we're very data-driven in a lot of things we do, but that story can be extraordinarily powerful. I would agree. Everybody, thanks so much. And uh, we'll have to do a follow-up to see where we've grown since this conversation. But thanks again, everybody, and have a great uh, rest of your day. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Absolutely. That wraps up another episode of Marketing Mavericks, where you can follow us by going to uh, Twitter. You can hash use the hashtag Marketing Mavericks. That's Marketing Mavericks with the number sign in front of it. Or you can find us on Google+. Plus. We do have a Google Plus page if you're a Google Pluser. Or maybe you want to email us. Yep, that's old school, but I, I read it. Um, you can go to mavericks at twit.tv. Let me know what guests you want to hear from, what topics you like, and what you want us to share. Other than that, have a great day, everybody. Until then, we'll talk to you next Monday.